Okay, so hi, my name is Sebastian Button. I'm a founding member of Historical Materialism Journal and the book series and the conferences, some of which you will already be familiar with. So I want to just to pitch to you the idea of you uh, subscribing to the journal, firstly. The journal comes out four times a year, published by Brill, over a thousand pages of uh, extremely important and stimulating uh, Marxist theory and Marxist history. Um, we have a discount at the moment for individual subscribers around the time of the, the London conference, and we very strongly uh, both request and uh, demand that you subscribe to the journal, that you uh, get other people to subscribe to the journal, and of course that you get uh, your institution, if you're part of a university or other institutions, to subscribe to the journal. We need more subscribers for this project to be able to expand and continue. The second thing I really wanted to push was the book series. Uh, the book series you also probably be familiar with, it's published by Brill Academic Press, and the, the volumes come out 12 months later. The Haymarket Books in Chicago paperback. Um, we have more than 200 volumes published now of translations of original work, of document collections, of uh, translations from uh, Marxist theory from across the world, from Japan to uh, uh, China to um, India to Latin America, very important Latin American list shaping up. In the book series and so on. Um, it's a really crucial intervention in Marxist uh, literature and uh, in uh, making Marxist theory available um, that really hasn't existed on this scale since the 1970s. So we'd like you to look at the book series, buy individual volumes, perhaps take up the offer of the book club that Haymarket is, uh, is, is uh, promoting. And also, of course, if, again, if you're part of an institution, to get your institution to buy as many volumes as possible. Uh, those are the two key elements of our activity, aside from the conferences, the journal and the book series. And we think it would be uh, well, we think it's essential, basically, for us, for our existence, for us to be able to continue to thrive for those to expand. So please, subscribe to the journal, buy the books and the book series, publicize both around you and help has built the historical materialism project. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Uh, good evening or good afternoon, depending on the time zone. Uh, my name is Panagiotis Soteris, and I'm a member of the editorial board of Historical Materialism Journal. And I would like to welcome you to uh, another uh, session of this year's Historical Materialism Conference, which we all hope will be the last one that we do online. And by next year, we return to in-person format in London. Uh, before uh, presenting uh, tonight's panel, uh, just to uh, repeat what uh, Sebastian Bajan, or more precisely Sebastian Bajan's avatar, just uh, uh, told you, the need to support the historical materialism project. Beginning with subscribing to the journal, because this means that you get four such volumes each year, more than a thousand, about a thousand pages of exciting Marxist theory uh, every year. And if you take advantage of the discount offered by Brill, uh, this could be just under 60 euros, uh, which I think is a fairly reasonable price. And also, uh, again, remind you the importance of the book series. Uh, we have now 250 titles in what is becoming one of the most important uh, Marxist uh, publishing projects in the English speaking publishing world. And uh, they appear first uh, with Brill, a uh, respected uh, academic publisher. They are expensive, but they are good for your institution if you to subscribe and get it for your university's library. But one year, 12 months exactly afterwards, its title appears with Haymarket as really affordable paperbacks. And please do take advantage of the 40% reduction uh, in prices by Haymarket if you order until the end of the conference. So it's a bargain, please take advantage of it. And also please donate to the historical material uh, project. Uh, if you registered through uh, an Eventbrite uh, webpage for this session, or you can always check uh, an Eventbrite page of uh, 
of, of some organization, you can see there is the possibility to donate. Uh, historical material and projects has costs, uh, and so uh, the past two years without an in-person conference has been a little bit difficult for us, so please donate any donation can make a difference. So that's in, in regards to our project. Now in regards to our panel entitled State Theory Post-Pandemic, we have uh, three uh, presenters. We have uh, Peter Bratches from uh, City University of New York. Uh, we've got uh, Anna Sturman from the University of Sydney, Australia, and we've got uh, FTC Manning from an educator with SFUSD uh, in San Francisco. Uh, each uh, presenter will have a, a maximum of 20 minutes so that there is time for discussion. Now, in regards to discussion, since this uh, uh, panel is uh, streamed through uh, YouTube, I would like to thank Haymarket for helping us also with streaming through the web YouTube channel. Uh, put any comments or questions in the chat box of YouTube, and we will uh, relay them to the uh, presenter so that they can respond to them. So uh, the floor now is to Peter, Peter Bratis, with his, with the title of his presentation is The Crisis of Reproduction and the End of Relative Autonomy? Question mark. Thank you, uh, Panayoti. I'm, I'm very happy to be here, although I have to admit I hate the uh, online Zoom in general and the online conferences, and I agree with you. Hopefully by next year we'll be back uh, uh, in person. Uh, in London, uh, having having the conference, I want to thank Paul for putting together this panel, uh, and I appreciate him uh, inviting me to participate. Uh, it, now, there are many panels uh, in the conference on state theory, and I've tried to follow. I followed uh, some, not all of them, uh, so far. I understood this panel to be a bit more. At least that's how I I, I focused my comments on uh, sort of, you know, what uh, challenges to state theory posed by the pandemic, you know, rethinking some of the approaches of, of Marxist state theory given the pandemic, and then also potentially uh, uh, some uh, uh, elements about what uh, st strategic questions about the future, you know, capitalism post pandemic, uh, what are some of the possibilities. Uh, now, one of the, uh, a tendency I noticed in some of the other panels on the state and it's related to this question of the challenges to state theory posed, posed by the pandemic, has been a tendency to revert to a kind of Iberian understanding of the state. Uh, that is questions posed in terms of strong and weak states, state capacities uh, uh, and so forth, uh, either implicitly or explicitly, uh, assume the state to be uh, a subject and something that is external to or distinct from society. Um, now in Marxist state theory, the uh, probably most significant uh, exponent of that position has been Fred Block, uh, uh, who wrote a number of important essays on this in the uh, uh, late 70s and, and uh, early 80s. And I think the, the, the political situation of the last 10, 15 years point to a severe limitation in that approach. I mean, it's not only for methodological reasons, let's say, that from the standpoint of Marxist state theory would be opposed to that kind of uh, dichotomy or that kind of uh, Weberian Marxist uh, 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 understanding of the state. But this approach of uh, Fred Bloch, for example, uh, posited the following, that the state is completely autonomous from society in terms of its subjectivity and the, the personnel who run the state. Uh, the state, however, is greatly limited by the power of the capitalist class in that it controls private investment. And thus state activities are largely limited and regulated by the need to maintain business confidence. However, in times of crises, he argued, when investment is already uh, uh, not happening. There is no business confidence to, to endanger. Then you see 
the state functioning in ways to expand its uh, uh, regulatory capacities to further rationalize the economy. Uh, uh, uh. And these moments, of course, become uh, the economists, I think, use the, the idea of a ratcheting effect. Over time, the economy becomes much more rationalized and the state uh, uh, bureaucracies uh, much more um, uh, powerful. We have seen uh, in the last couple of crises, certainly, the financial crisis of 2008 onwards and the pandemic, that no nothing like that happened, even in the face of a severe uh, limitation in uh, investment, there was no uh, 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 great increase in the, the regulatory capacities of the state or any further rationalizations of, um, of the economy. So I think for methodological reasons, which we can talk about as well, but also in terms of the lessons of the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years, I think that the, the, uh, the Blockian or Weberian Marxist approach uh, 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 the pandemic certainly has shown it to be lacking in uh, many important uh, 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 ways. Um, of course, for uh, most Marxist state theory, uh, certainly from Gramsci's notion of the integral state through Althusser and Poulanzas, um, there is no autonomy of the state from society. The question of autonomy or, rel or relative autonomy is not vis-a-vis -vis society, it's vis-a-vis uh, 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 particular interests within society. So the relative autonomy of the state, you know, the famous phrase from uh, Althusser and Poulanzas, uh, refer to uh, either the autonomy of uh, the political from uh, the economic or the ideological and vice versa. And concurrently, they also refer to the autonomy that the state may have from the particular or the narrow interest of the capitalist class, the capacity to act against uh, 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 the short-term demands or interests of the capitalist class. Um, so uh, the, the question of then how this works, uh, how the autonomy works in a way allows you to read backwards and assess the nature of the class struggle in that moment. If the autonomy of the state is a product of the class struggle mediated through the uh, uh, institutions of the state, the institutional materiality of the state, it allows you in a sense to read backwards and to gauge the intensity and the successes and failures of, uh, failures of the class struggles uh, in that uh, moment. Uh, and I think here, there are many, many uh, difficult and important questions to examine. Uh, the importance for, for uh, uh, Marxism, Marxism, I believe, to insist on this question of rel relative autonomy uh, had to do with the function of the state to secure the conditions for the extended reproduction of capitalism. You know, from uh, in Gramsci's work, uh, even in the work of Karl Polanyi, you know, his idea of the double movement uh, in the Great Transformation, uh, through the work of uh, Poulantas and Bob Jessup and others, the ability of the state to know what the reproductive needs of society were, in a sense, for the state uh, uh, policies to function in the ways that uh, uh, rationalize the economy, uh, rationalize certain economic contradictions and allow for an extended reproduction of capital and social relations was premised on the openness of the institution. You know, the, the, the struggles that exist uh, 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 in the terrain of politics that moderate, mediate, push uh, things to proceed or to take place in a way that uh, 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 secures some of these reproductive needs. So the, the, the relative autonomy was a necessary, was necessary for the function of the state to properly work. There is no omnipotent knowledge of the reproductive needs of capitalism. Rather, it's the outcome of the struggles themselves. <coughs> and 
again, Ployani is double movement and uh, so forth. I think, and I think here we have a number uh, of very serious uh, questions. Uh, to begin with, we see a, um, uh, what Stigler call, has called uh, the, uh, the loss of, the lost spirit of capitalism. That if we think in his terms about the first spirit being uh, uh, the Protestant work ethic, let's say the spirit of capitalism, of the capitalism of the 19th century, being guided by that ethic. And if the ethic of the 20th century uh, was one of planning and regulation, Fordist planning and regulation. Uh, uh, and now we're, we're in a kind of, from his standpoint, a kind of nowhere's land where it's not neither of those two certainly, nor something else. And if we look at the measures the state has taken or states have taken in the context of the pandemic, we see a very uh, serious limitation in, in, in crisis when it comes to uh, uh, trying to secure the conditions for extended reproduction. First of all, we see that we're stuck still in the language of the 1930s. You know, the furthest that uh, we can uh, think or we can imagine is a repetition of the 1930s in a new deal. Everything becomes the new new deal, you know, the green new deal, uh, uh, or various uh, uh, versions of um, these kinds of things. Uh, the practical measures taken by most states uh, are completely uh, in harmony with the existing models of capital accumulation to the degree that even suspending intellectual property rights of the pharmaceutical firms who are, that are producing the vaccines has seemed unthinkable. The most they can do is simply buy and order more uh, uh, doses of the vaccine, uh, but not necessarily to take more significant actions and uh, 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 produce the vaccine themselves, you know, or allow uh, other other uh, 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 firms to produce the vaccine. And again, it's very. Um, difficult to understand in a sense, because if you think of the losses to the pharmaceutical industries, let's say, how that might limit uh, certain profits compared to the huge economic losses that the continuation of the pandemic presents, it would seem to be a very easy position to take that, of course, the state should suspend, in this case, intellectual property rights. The inability of states to address some key causal factors of the rise of the pandemic. We know from some of our people, Rob Wallace and others, of course, that industrial farming is, is a, a huge factor behind the, uh, at least the, the uh, uh, frequency uh, uh, of the rise of, the, of these pandemics. That is all a mathematical certainty that by continuing with these forms of, of agriculture, more and more pandemics will come, perhaps even of course more deadly and disastrous than the one that uh, uh, we are enduring. And there is not one, not one attempt to address the crisis on this level, which is again, a huge uh, problem if we talk about the extended reproduction of existing models of accumulation and uh, uh, capitalist relations. That you have to at some point address these contradictions if you hope to extend the life of capitalism or continue with uh, the reproductive requisites of societies uh, uh, for the future. Uh, we have a, 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 a you know, uh, the, in the last five, six months, of the various uh, attempts to establish some uh, added regulations or social programs, you see in contrast, let's say to the 1930s, a huge shift in the realm of political possibilities. So the uh, uh, Joe Biden plan, the initial plan, which was uh, 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 presumably to cost $3.5 trillion, was presented as being extremely extravagant, way too much money to be able to spend. 
the, new, the first seven years of the New Deal in the 1930s is estimated to have costed somewhere around 41 or $42 billion, uh, which would have been, which or was, of the year it began, and that was the seven years of spending, it was around 80% of GDP. So the, the 80% of GDP, of the one year's GDP, was the cost for the first seven years of that plan. The 3.5 trillion would have been about 6% of GDP of this year of 2000 and, and, or 2020, let's say. You know, if the American economy is about 23, 23 billion, uh, uh, trillion, the 3.5 trillion would have been about 6%, certainly much less than 1.5% of GDP over the 10 years. Uh, uh, and even that was unthinkable, you know, from where I'm sitting now, there are the Triborough Bridge, George Washington Bridge, Lincoln Tunnel, West Side Highway, the extension of Riverside Park. There are uh, uh, huge public works projects that took place in that decade that now are unthinkable. They can't even manage to secure the monies to maintain those projects, let alone to think about a kind of, you know, new version or, or a, a new uh, uh, way to uh, uh, organize uh, 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 future capitalist accumulation. Uh, so we have there, again, if we read backwards from that, the state of the class struggle, we have to conclude, I think, that it's not going very well, that the, that the struggles from below are so weak in part that the state institutions have become so rigid and bureaucratized in response to those struggles that still exist, uh, 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 that the effects, the state, the, the, the policy effects, the, the substantive effects of these struggles have really, really, really uh, diminished the possibility of relative autonomy. The relative autonomy has decreased very significantly from uh, previous decades. The lockdown in the pandemic, on the other side of the equation, perhaps, did open up some possibilities. Because as we know, uh, the, the, uh, the everyday repetitions, the ideological state apparatuses of school and work and uh, 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 cons consuming and so forth, as they were suspended, opened up some possibilities. And certainly I think it is safe to say that uh, events like the Black Lives Matters protests of um, uh, last year would not have happened without the lockdown, would not have happened if everyone was stuck in the same routines of going to school, or if it would have been much less intense and much less uh, widespread. Uh, but again, given the rigidity of, of the institutions, the bureaucratization, the fiscal crisis, the inability to extract uh, uh, more concessions from uh, uh, the capitalist class. Even those movements ended up being of minimal uh, um, impact, uh, which again is a very difficult uh, uh, situation to try to, try to make sense of. Uh, but even, you know, we had in, in, in New York City, you know, even in the face of all of these protests, they elected a former police officer as the new mayor. You know, and there have been no significant, even in the narrow terms of police reform, there have been, there's been minimal uh, uh, impact uh, uh, or reforms in, in, uh, in, in the repressive state apparatuses. Uh, uh, so I think uh, this really brings to, you know, I, I began by, by um, uh, being critical of the, of, of the, the very Marxist approach to the state. But I think here, even uh, uh, the other side of things, the kind of Gramscian and Pulanzasian side, really seems to have reached a limit in terms of its, uh, if not analytical capacities, in terms of its understanding how uh, 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 the state and class struggle uh, uh, interact and function. Because it seems more and more that we come to a point where the possibilities for relative autonomy 
uh, become less and less and less. And this uh, 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 points to very difficult strategic dilemmas uh, for uh, 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 the working class struggles, the struggles from below. You know, the limits to being able to influence uh, 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 the uh, public policies and so forth through the uh, the intensities of struggles that uh, mimic the past. You know, it seems things have to become more and more and more and more confrontational, more intense for there to be any possibility of, of success. Um, so maybe I'll I see my time is running out. Maybe I'll leave it at that and hopefully we can have uh, some discussions. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Peter. Uh, I hesitated because in Greece, we always call him Akis, not Peter. That's something I can disclose, uh, I suppose, which is the diminutive of his name uh, in Greek, anyway. Uh, uh, so, I give now the floor to uh, Anna Sturman, and the title of your presentation is Rejecting the Autonomous State, a Materialist, Ecofeminist Theorization, and I expect the same discipline with time that uh, Peter uh, displayed. Thank you very much. Uh, Thanks, Peter. That was great. And I hope that what I talk about today will respond and we'll get some generative discussion. Um, I'd like to start by thanks, um, thanking everyone who's made this possible and allowed me to be here and talk about the state today. Um, and as a final uh, point of order, land that was never ceded, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and future, as is custom here. So it is particularly poignant to reflect on my position from another settler colony, Aotearoa, New Zealand, given the topic uh, that I'm talking about today is the capitalist state, the power structure which enforces ongoing violent occupation of these spaces. And that's a contradiction that I'll reference a couple of times as I go through today's material. So uh, on looking back over what I promised to talk about today with this paper, I realized that I've bitten off far more that could be chewed in 15 to 20 minutes. So I'm going to do sort of a, a sprint through the different sections of the talk, and hopefully I will manage to be as clear as possible and cover things off satisfactorily. So just as a general statement and echoing what Peter said, there's a lot going on. Um, there are social, ecological and economic crises every which way we look uh, and certainly in no small part because of COVID-19, the state is being dragged back into discussions in ways that have been relatively uncommon for the past couple of decades. So the present moment defined by the growing influence of far right movements and the inability of the liberal centre to acknowledge the structural drivers of any reactionary tendencies uh, is a dangerous moment. And I wanna talk about why I think serious engagement with the theorization of the capitalist state is required to avoid the worst possible outcomes of the social forces that are arrayed at this time. So I will begin very briefly with an overview of the materialist eco-feminist framework that I mentioned in the title of my paper uh, and situate that so that we can understand how I view the extended reproduction of the political economy before shifting to talk about how I see the capitalist state is implicated in that. So beginning uh, the materialist eco-feminist tradition, I'm drawing primarily on the work here of Mary Mallor and Ariel Salah. So, uh, this work builds from the fundamental contradiction that Lise Vogel set out initially in her unitary theory between the biological time of human reproduction and the temporal rhythm of the reproduction of labor in capitalism. So materialist ecofeminists then build out from this to note the further connected contradiction between ecological reproduction and capitalist reproduction. So there's a double dialectic in operation with humans and capitalist societies reproducing themselves in and against, and sometimes beyond, but not always, in and against the capital relation, which is itself in and against the rest of nature. So 
in this tradition, the disembedded, disembedded and disembodied subject is the perfect capitalist subject, able not to extinguish, but simply to displace the costs of their socio-ecological reproduction onto other human and non-human natures. So the, the operationalization of this, the way I sort of approach it, is through the double internality at the core of James O'Connor's second contradiction of capital, which is about the conditions of production necessary to the capitalist mode of production. Uh, and this ties together with Neil Smith's production of Nature Theorem. So together, using creating a synthesis of these, we can see how humans through historically specific forms of labor interact with the rest of nature to reproduce ourselves. So James O'Connor's conditions of production or the conditions of reproduction in the parlance of the materialist eco-feminists are the external, physical, communal, and personal or labor power. So these are all constantly being reproduced through human labor in and against the capital relation in concert with these worlds of appropriated socio-natures upon which capital ultimately relies to drive down costs. So with that big garbled explanation of theory, let's talk about what that might mean. Um, so O'Connor suggested that one of the most important aspects of this are the inevitable crises of socio-ecological reproduction which emerge from the tensions between capital's expansionary dynamic and the aforementioned biological and ecological reproduction of the conditions. So these present opportunities for movement building by revealing the contingent nature of crisis resolution. And probably you can see where I'm going with this already in terms of the state form. Anyway, as I and others have argued elsewhere, the second contradiction production of nature synthesis shares most of it, much of its basic logics with the metabolic rift school. Uh, and I know that there have been some great presentations at this conference from the metabolic rift theorists, but um, the approach that I'm talking about is concerned primarily with the animating socio natures rather than the operation of the abstraction of capital. So it's inherently geared towards thinking about political strategy uh, and the mobilization of the social forces that Peter was talking about then operating on the state. So specifically, the way I think about it is providing a way to consider convergences between labor, environmental, social, and other movements uh, through the expansion of what is considered a labor concern or of interest to the labor movement. So given the depths of our current crises and the already visible eco-fascist tendencies coming out um, among other far-right strains, I suggest that this focus on how you pull together these animating socio-natures is imperative. Such strategic alliances or, you know, um, building connections between these movements, obviously not a fait accompli. I'm not suggesting that it would be easy you know, we are where we are. However, uh, I think with the opening up of the state now is a terrain of contestation in this age of perpetual escalating intersecting crisis, we can start to see the generalization of the state proper as the contingent field of social relations that James O'Connor suggested was so vital to movement building. So turning to look at the capitalist state, so in the classic theory, the state's the actor that works in the collective interests of capital to ensure the conditions of production aren't destroyed in the routine operation of capitalist production. So I think um, that simplistic reading is, you know, useful at a level of abstraction, but when we're trying to get to the nitty gritty of how to actually deal with the world as it is right now, it's less useful, hence the rejection of the autonomous state character in favor of a more nuanced theorization. So I suggest that the state following Polanzas, following lots of other people, is a set of social relations through which the articulations of exploitation and appropriation are stabilized over time, according to the shifting balance of class struggle, again, that Peter mentioned. This shifting balance is therefore inflicted not only through the machinations of capitals as they seek to force down the costs of reproduction through the state form and forms of socialization and passing costs, but by the internal divisions within the working class itself. For example, to go back to Vogel, the understandings of gender and labor which support particular configurations of labor division or exploitation and appropriation. 
So clearly this theorization, as I said, draws upon Palantzis, and it is, I read it sort of in conversation with the open Marxism state debates, which I think there is a lot of value in. So following some of the critiques, though, of the open Marxist state theory uh, that have been delivered really succinctly by Andreas Bela and Adam Morton in particular, I again um, focus on the forms of class struggle which are engaged in the necessarily internally contradictory and contingent state form, rather than looking perpetually to the abstraction as the sum total of state analysis. Uh, and I would note, look, it's not an uncritical acceptance of Palantzis' later state theory. I do agree with Simon Clark that there's still a whiff of structuralism in there, but we all know the tragic tale of Palantzis. Um, and I feel like he would have worked through it if he had time. That's conjecture. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I do suggest the tendencies Palantzis um, became attuned to sort of particularly in his later work with institutional materiality and so forth, really breathe some life into the operationalization of the open Marxist idea of the state and their focus on abstraction. This approach obviously also uh, owes a lot to the political Marxism of Alan Mikesons Wood, mainly around the need to attend to the iterating forms of power which stabilize and destabilize capitalist political economies. And again, um, there's a, you know, a similar critique to be leveled here. And again, uh, Bella and Morton have done this, a critique of the way that use value and the contradiction of capital is theorized there. So, Again, pulling attention to the internal contradiction between use and exchange value or concrete and abstract labor that contemporary social reproduction theorists um, and the person who comes to mind is Sue Ferguson identify as crucial to movement building. Um, we're trying to hold that constantly at the forefront of this idea of the materialist eco-feminist state. Uh, right, so I've got another little section on the metabolic rift school, but I don't think we need to revisit it. Basically what I'm saying is rather than looking for a silver bullet uh, in the state form or for a moment of fundamental break and so on, I think it's the strategic inflection and navigation of the state form as part of a broader struggle that is of most importance right now for anti-capitalist state theory and movement building. And this has been put very well by Mahia and Kachaturian when they say, uh, we suggest that struggles on the terrain of the state can be advanced by and also help to build a broader political ecology of movements and forces. A genuine mass socialist politics requires successfully advancing political struggles within state institutions without at the same time falling into the trap of social democratization that further accommodates the working class to capitalism. So, uh, that all builds up to me saying, I think that the very first thing that, well, the, not the very first thing that needs to be done, but a thing that needs to be given more attention is the need to build popular struggle, which incorporates the state as an enabling condition of further struggle. So to abandon the abandonment of the state. So strategically, I think that the point Stuart Hall raised about Palantzas analysis and the missing links in it are really important here. So basically the hegemonic understandings of what the state is within a broader project inflect how it is strategically navigated in pursuit of contemporary aims. Uh, in discussing the rise of Thatcher, as I'm sure everyone is very familiar with, Hall suggested that an animating authoritarian populism was required to enable the legitimation of the authoritarian statism uh, which was Polanzas' term, or the steady sharpening of contradictions within the state form and their resolution through evacuation of democratic participation in state forms and functions. Um, and a quote um, here is that Hall wrote that Polanzas did not sufficiently recognize that this progress towards authoritarian statism has been secured at the base by a complementary shift in popular consent to authority, the product of a remarkable and intensive ideological struggle. So what I'm trying to pull here from Hall is the basic premise that transforming the state can only ever be part of this broader transformation of social forces, 
but that to grasp the state as an element of such transformation, the, the left is required to treat it as a terrain worth engaging on. Uh, and as an aside that isn't really an aside at all, uh, this approach to the state also gives us a way to engage in an internationalist praxis which is serious about ensuring climate and other debts the global north owes actually fall due because the intertwined and interdependent extended socio-ecological reproduction of national political economies means that the left in the capitalist core must find ways to reorient our domestic socio-ecological reproduction so that it doesn't rely on continuing domination of the capitalist peripheries. And this is achievable only through grappling with existing articulations of power. So I'm aware I don't have much time left, but I briefly want to ground all of that uh, garbled theory in a discussion of an actual concrete situation, which is New Zealand in the lead up to uh, its voluntary quote unquote, structural adjustment in the 1980s. And lessons I think we can draw from that experience about under theorizing the capitalist state as an aspect of struggle. So uh, context, I recently um, uh, in my thesis used this as like a, a piece of discussion. So basically the, the, the big context is New Zealand is a nominally core capitalist country. You may not even know where it is. It's close to Australia at the bottom of the world. Uh, its economy has been built around agricultural exports uh, and it has a very particular set of contradictions which animate the political economy because of that. So very small, small scale, back end of nowhere, huge cost to get anything anywhere based off primary production. Long story short, uh, uh, an extensive welfare state had been built off the back of labor struggles of the depression era uh, and then expanded in all sorts of contradictory ways in the post-war boom to facilitate extended ecological reproduction as the basis of agriculture uh, and also to facilitate the socialization of social reproduction which couldn't get kick-started um, by itself and so relied on the ongoing agricultural sector. So a huge expansion in the state form and functions occurred to facilitate the situation and it created basically a bureaucratic nightmare that united voices from the left and the right in seeking the reconfiguration of the state. And I suggest that this focus on the state as the source or the prime mover of the obstacles that were facing movements really came to define um, how the state was rearticulated. So for example, the burgeoning environmental movement uh, were incredibly frustrated with the centralized and seemingly unaccountable state. Uh, they were a big part of the coalition that brought it down. There were also the frustrations of key players in the agricultural sector who wanted to shift to new uh, surplus value production. Uh, the state was continuing to underwrite the earlier one. Also feminist movements emerging all the you know, normal components of the new social movements were coming along. Feminist movements were uh, mobilizing against the state as the authority uh, through which unequal pay and recognition was delivered, et cetera. And there's a, a notable um, other element here to do with the settler colonial context and the decolonial strategies that were being used by the Maori people, but it's not directly relevant to this specific coalition. So, Basically what happened is they imploded, they contributed to the delegitimization of the state as it was uh, and structural adjustment occurred, which eventuated in a complete devolution of state power, which was assumed to equate to democratization of decision-making. Uh, but basically, you know, the story that we all know was going to happen. It worked to disaggregate contestation, it strengthened the state for capital, it enabled uh, a massive new process of resource consenting that uh, fueled the expansion of industrial agriculture, etc. But the popular rejection of that crystallization of compromise embedded in the state form was really cannily mobilized by social forces within, with a broader transformative vision, while the left, whose focus had been on the state as the prime mover, and yeah, as the, as the prime mover, were disassembled by the whole process of rearticulation. Uh, and since then have been increasingly frustrated by the limits of contestation built into the rearticulated state 
despite, uh, you know, it being nominally more devolved and democratic, there's still the demarcation between the economic and the political. So basically, it had been strategically inflicted in ways disadvantageous for the left. And I think that there are real lessons for that in this moment where the state is being opened up as you know, a viable terrain for contestation once more at a time of escalating intersecting crisis. Uh, we need to think through these ideas and exactly what happened last time around, I suggest, and try and apply those lessons to the moment that we find ourselves in with a totally different array of social forces. Uh, and as a starting point, I think we can look to the social forces navigating the present moment and consider how the state is being implicitly and explicitly positioned in order to return to O'Connor's formulation and the importance of demonstrating the ultimately non-determined outcomes of restructuring as a result of crisis. And I think I just come in under the 20 minute mark. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Anna. Uh both for a really uh, thought-provoking presentation and for uh, the discipline in regards to the time, which will give us a time for discussion. And now uh, the floor is to FTC Manning, and the title is also uh, really interesting and provocative. There is no anti-capitalist jurisdiction jurisprudence, law as anti-communist social form and the abolition of the current state of things. Thanks Panagiotis and thanks everybody on the panel and everyone who's out there in virtual land. I, I didn't know I wasn't gonna be able to see like comments on YouTube, so I'll come check later <laughs> if there are any comments, but uh, um, hi, everybody. So I uh, proposed a talk that is actually not about specifically state theory post pandemic. Um, but I think it goes well with the talks that we've been having. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna launch into it. And I think we're gonna have some really nice space for discussion. Um, <clears throat> well, I want to I want to start with laying out two questions. One is, what is the state? And the other one is, what should we do with the state? Often and inevitably, our answer to the former, what is the state, is determined by our pre-existing thoughts about the latter. How should we engage with the state? For instance, if we think the electoral political system is useful and a good way to change things, we will have a theory of the state that endorses and justifies that kind of participation. So, Admittedly, the theory of the state that I will develop here comes from a longstanding skepticism of engagement with states and the field of the political. Um, but nonetheless, I'm gonna say that my definition of the state is more objective and more logical than everybody else's. So, I mean, other than the people I'm drawing. Um, but for the sake of art. So first I wanted to bring in um, a few comments from other speakers over uh, the week of panels here at HM uh, to kind of lay out the common Marxian communist socialist theories of the state. Um, I would say broadly that Marxists and socialists and such tend to view the state with skepticism and weariness, acknowledging its use as a bludgeon against lower classes, as a manipulative tool to dissolve and counteract resistance and revolt. But, and there's always a but, there is the possibility of somehow pushing the state, taking over the state to make something better or to claim fleeting moments of state power that encourage long-term change. Um, and I think that there are very good arguments coming from this position. So for example, uh, Parangiatis Sotirius, in your uh, contributions at the very beginning of the conference, describe the state as the material condensation of the relations of force, which is a, a familiar and powerful theory of the state that can be found in Lenin, early Marx and Engels, who advocated for the transformation of the state apparatus. This theory of the state enables invocations such as uh, his, his call for engagement with existing states towards the goal of, quote, democratic participation, expanding basic, basic political freedoms against all forms of oppression, including pervasive, the pervasive development of a surveillance state. 
Um, so, secondly, uh, Paolo Gerbaudo raised the position I think it was on Thursday, raised uh, this kind of Pulancian Althusserian position, Stuart Hall, that I believe. Um, that I believe Anna was, was speaking to as well, um, where we have this idea of the state as inherently a reproducer of capitalist social relations, a superstructural sapling of capital, but the state also has a modicum of relative autonomy, which allows for the possibility that people can resist in certain ways and wrest power in the political field. Um, earlier today, Tamara Karos argued that the, the argued um, that Marx also suggests that revolutions must smash the state completely in the 18th of Brumaire. So this is a kind of another thing, smashing the state completely, getting rid of it completely. Um, and she, she in her talk, um, Tamara brought us to sort of, I felt like it was like a fervor of smashing and rejecting the state, abolishing the political state, as she called it. But right at this moment where we get to like, we gotta get rid of it completely. She reinscribed the field of the political um, in invoking a possibility for true democracy in what she called the world republic. Can we have a political space without states? Can the political be anti-state? Well, I've always felt that most of these theories issuing from a lot of um, the same kind of sets of, of thinkers over the last 200 years or so, um, the, you know, we have the Pulances Althusserium, we have the, um, the, the, the earlier theorists in the, in, in the 30s and with Marx, and most of it is not really giving us a definition of the state or of the political or of law, uh, which might connect a theory of the state innately to a larger account of capitalism. So in general, I think that the state remains a kind of bizarre but omnipresent excrescence the sphere of the political is treated either as a natural trans-historical aspect of human existence. Like wherever you have human societies, there is a political field that is being engaged somehow. Maybe it is in conjunction with other fields or not. So the political is trans-historical. Or in the case of the sort of Palancian perspective, um, you know, he argues, as Anna mentioned, that the political and the economic become severed in capitalism producing a semi-autonomous sphere of the political. And Ellen Wood, as you mentioned, takes up this very strongly. Um, even in this last position, however, the political sphere is only a problem, like the, sev the severing of the political sphere is only a problem because it is severed from the economic, because it is disconnected. And Ellen Wood argues very forcefully that we need to like reconnect them in order to be able to do anything. Um, and because in this, in this position, the political is the sphere in which we make change. It has to, somehow. Politics itself is still broadly something we should get involved with, because how else do we make change? But uh, I've been unsatisfied with sort of the lack of a, of, a, of a rigorous definition of the political and of the state. And in such, I've been drawn as many before me and many after me to Pashukhanis, um, after a, a, a derivation to the state derivation debate, and I'm not sure if you guys have found this, all of the state derivationists cite Pashukhanis as the way they describe how the state derives from capital. So, so once we finally get to Pashukhanis, we find that his position is much less forgiving to the state and to the political than all of these other positions. So firstly, and in my experience, thrillingly, Pashukhanis analyzes not the state itself, but law and jurisprudence. For Pashukhanis, the legal form is a necessary form to capital because it is implied and required for exchange and production. So to exchange commodities, including to sell one's labor power to a capitalist for a wage, an amount of formal equality must be positive and a uh, as China Mieville uh, summarizes, a specific form of social regulation is necessary. It must formalize the method of settlement of any such dispute without diminishing either party's sovereignty or equality. That form, that form that is entailed is law. In this, Pashukhanis lays the groundwork for a form theory of law. 
how we might describe it today. Abstract law here is derived from the most bare bones, basic elements of the capitalist mode of production. For capitalism to function in the most minor way on this account, it requires law because it requires equal fungible legal subjects. Or I should emphasize it requires the fiction of equal fungible legal subjects. From this understanding of law, we can see this, we can then see states as one of the most successful ways in which law is centralized and reproduced. States here are concatenations of law. Law is flowing everywhere and all over in a sense. Mob law is still law, even if it's not state law. But states are a very substantially, uh, very substantial structure that crystallizes out of this law ecosystem. Just as the form of the cooperation, just as the form of the corporation, like the, first the joint stock company and later the much more complicated forms of corporations, crystallize from the more basic form of a capitalist. So a state, as we know it, crystallizes from the more basic form of law and jurisprudence. And if the form theory of law states that law as we know it is born of the blood-soaked, bone-ravaging system of capital, then law must be abolished, not improved, not perfected. And if law must, so must states be abolished, not improved, not perfected. And if law and states, so also the field of the political must be abolished, too cool, for it is nothing beyond the legal. At the high school, okay, so pro a provincial example from my job. At the high school that I work at, one of the laws is that is constantly broken and fought over is students going to class. So some students don't wanna go to class. The same students over and over again, they wanna walk through the halls, claim the corners and the spaces. The school hires security guards to try and get the kids to go to class, to yell and chase and coerce them. And some of the students tell me there's this one who he can teleport. Like, he can teleport, I swear. And it's kind of true, like, I don't know how he does it, but he does it. After all, if they don't go to class, they will get a truancy call home. Their parents or guardians could end up in court around them not attending class. And what if we abolished the law and had no security guards? But we might ask, how will we make sure that kids are learning? And that's a big question. And that's the right question. And that's my, the little microcosm of the questions we ask when we say, what does it mean to get rid of law? Rather than how can we prevent truancy or how, or on the other side, how do we catch murderers? And, the, and there is a connection within discourse within public schools about truancy and crime. So I'm not making up that connection. That, that, is, that is put out there frequently. Um, we might ask, how can we make sure young people learn what they want and need to learn? How can we make sure that we do not need or want to kill each other without law in the state? So um, theorist Savannah Shange writes at length about the space of the hallways. We're gonna stay in the hallways for just a minute and then we're gonna come back, okay? So she writes at length about the space of the hallways in public schools. She says that, quote, the corridors are the exceptions exception, a space filled with the excess of those without access to police. Shange describes a white teacher at a faculty meeting in a public school saying that we should treat students being in the hallways as if it's the apocalypse. It must be prevented at all costs. All must rally to enforce this law. And Shange writes, quote, she might have been right when she said it should be the apocalypse, the end of the world, for students to be in the hallway. What she may not have realized is that it was her world as she knows it that they are hinting toward ending. The students in the hallways spatialized the abolitionist imperative to uncivil disobedience, which I am kind of interpreting right as like non, not engaging the political field, non-engagement of the So what are we worried of when we cling to the state form 
to the protection of law, which always implies law enforcement and some kind of judge and some kind of jury. And that's not a rhetorical question. I'm really curious. What are people afraid of? If anyone wants to ask a question about it or to tell me what they think, I'd love to hear it. Um, and I'm motivated in this kind of avenue of questioning by Ruth Wilson Gilmore's approach to talking about prison abolition. And like really thinking like, what is, what is the fears that we have been taught to make us think these things are necessary? Um, but of course, many people are not afraid to advocate for total abolition of civil society in the state form. So now I'm gonna turn a little bit to the theorists that are working um, from a space where the, all of that is being questioned. So um, for every tacit endorsement of the state form as useful and hopeful arena of struggle, there have been arguments which undermine its very basis. So for example, um, quite infamously, I think at this point, uh, Frank Wilderson has, has shown that Gramsci's notion of civil society, or has argued that Gramsci's notion of civil society is predicated on black social death. Um, and no growth into, as Gramsci puts it, the self-regulation of civil society could repair that foundational murder. Uh, Pierre Machere has argued uh, that the very notion of subjectivity that Althusser bases his conception of the state on and ideological state apparatuses is a white subjectivity that does not include what it means to be a subject for people who are not white. Uh, recently, T.O. Wilson has argued that, quote, Black citizens are outside of the protection of law, yet easily and routinely within its disciplinary reach. And so Black studies exists as a critique of all that law has wrought. This thorough critique of law from Black studies has articulated, I think, an essential aspect of law and capitalism, which bears directly upon a form theory of law, as I'm drawing, as we are drawing from Hashitani's moments. Um, let's see, I have four minutes left, what can I do? Yeah, I got the rest of it. So uh, Wilson continues, the law has a dynamic life beyond the courtroom, a life of constructing and disassembling Black life. J.T. Rowan uh, has excavated and detailed one such disassemblement I want to say this in like a French accent, this is semblement of a woman um, named Donetta Hill in South Philadelphia, who in 1991 was accused, tried, and convicted of double murder despite no concrete physical evidence or witnesses, then separated from her children and sentenced with execution. So Roanne writes of her sitting on the witness stand during trial, recounting the abuses she experienced and spitting at the jury. Uh, Roanne writes, Quote, Hill's pointed reenactment and redirection of the scene of her capture, her turn to spit in the face of the people, disclosed the people as embodied in the jury, as a configuration of power gaining coherence through her derision, condemnation, and future death. It's the people that Hill's spitting registers as in need of abolishment. So here again, we have this idea that the whole idea of a homogenous civil society, homogenous, the people, this, this concept, which is coeval with our understanding of law has to be abolished as well. So uh, if Derek Bell writes of, of the US that, quote, black people will never gain full equality in this country, then we must consider the illusory invocation of legal equality that Pashukhanis describes as that you know, Pashukhanis describes this like illusory legal equality. And we have to realize that it also establishes non-subjects. The moment you instantiate this legal subjectivity so that we can have exchange, you, you have the capacity that becomes filled immediately to create non-subjects in a, in a wild hierarchy amongst the working class that is always racial. Many have argued that formal legal equality is always coeval with entrenched inequality. I'm making no intervention there, but my aim here is to integrate this fact with the form theory of law and the state. 
law, state, and the political always produce death and destruction for some so that others may live and thrive. This is, an Im this is imminent to the capitalist mode of production as the commodity for, this is, sorry, let me do that one again. This is as imminent to the capitalist mode of production as the commodity form. So I think I'll just end. This is like a nice little quote from um, Shang, Savannah Shange again. She says, revolution seeks to win the control of the state and its resources, while abolition wants to quit playing and raise the stadium of the settler slaver society for good. And that's the kind of question I want to pose. Can we, what do we think? Can we, can we integrate this into our rigorous theory of logical theory of capitalism? And then I'm not saying like, I'm gonna go fight for like better welfare and like better healthcare. I'm not saying I'm not gonna do that, right? So given that I'm not saying like, don't ever engage with the state, like, what do we think? Can we let go of what Pasha Kanisus calls like our, what does he say exactly? He talks about like being just committed to law and jurisprudence and being unable to let it go. Can we let it go? Okay, thanks all. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Francesca. Uh, okay, so uh, again, I would like to tell our viewers that they can place their questions and comments in the YouTube chat, and we will uh, relay them to the presenters so that they can discuss them, and we have time for discussion. So, uh, okay, to, but, but however, to enable a little bit of discussion, I have thought of three questions, one for its presenter myself. Uh, so, uh, my first question will be for Peter. And it will be, uh, I mean, you described the situation where uh, the state uh, as a material condensation of forces seems to be in its actual functioning, both uh, unwilling and incapable of, you know, performing what was included in the idea of the relative autonomy of the, of the state, namely, you know, also slightly catering for the subaltern classes in order to sort of but but at the same time it is not challenged to a great extent by by the subaltern classes so it is it seems like you're describing a situation when when we have aspects of a catastrophic equilibrium <laughs> the inability but without you know the the main aspect of a catastrophic equilibrium, namely a strong movement that actually challenged the. So I would like you, if you want to explain further that. This is a question for Peter. For Anna, I have a, I have a more theoretical question because I was really, uh, I found really interesting the way you tried to uh, combine uh, open Marxist approach and Polanges and to try to bring a dialogue. Uh, if you could expand on that, that would be really good because, you know, traditionally, traditionally we think open Marxism more with, a, with associated more with, uh, you know, a value form theoretical approach, uh, you know, logical derivation of the state, which usually when it is translated into, uh, you know, practical, uh, solutions for movements usually tends into a kind of a very radical anti-capitalist which says if first we abolish the value form and this but in some way you know get help us get rid of the state in contrast to a Polangian approach which is stronger and stronger movements inducing uh, transformation so i would really like to see the dialogue on that and to francesca my question will be uh, although you know i'm, I'm really <laughs> in favor of anyone reminding of the deeper uh, anti-statism of, of Marxist theory, there's always the question of the transition process or, or, or that historical phase of transition and to what extent, even if we get rid, even if we try to get rid of this abstract universality of law and how it acts as a, as a mystification of social relations of oppression, what about, let's say, you know, uh, 
the guarantee is that in this transition process where still power uh, relations of power and exploitation still exist where if there is some space for for a different form of legality uh, sort of a socialist legality you know enhancing uh, the rights of the subaltern or even in a certain way protecting them even against the supposed uh, supposed the social state or, or is you know any transition process just just a, only a process of abolition uh, that, if you could expand on that that would be really interesting because you know this this debate is not just a theoretical debate this is part of the history of the working class movement. This is part of Soviet history <laughs> to an extent to which, uh, you know, a revolutionary power is just a power by decree, a kind of, or, or it also should include, incorporate guarantees that we usually associate with law, guarantees of rights in the Soviet Union. So these are uh, my three questions, one for each one, and I hope that we will get also some questions from uh, our uh, viewers. So who wants to go first? Okay. So Anna, you go first. Oh no, I was pointing at other people, but I'll do it. I'll take the hit first, you guys. Uh, so that is obviously a fantastic point that you raise. And I knew when I threw it in there at the last moment that someone was probably going to catch me on it. So basically, maybe I'll answer this by talking about how I sort of met these theorists in turn and saw them speaking to one another. And then that will help explain where I'm coming from here. So I think... The key concepts that Polansas really leans into towards his, you know, 1978 writing, as opposed to the earlier, more Althusserian, structuralist, functionalist uh, ideas that he had, have a lot to give an open Marxist or a state derivationist theorization of the state. In terms of just concretizing the institutional materiality that they're talking about, even if you're talking about the state as a derivation of the value form or as another facet of the fundamental contradiction in capitalist society. And so I think in the same way that I try and draw when I'm looking at eco-Marxist theory, when you try and draw on the animating force that is actually animating capital and struggle in and against the capital relation, it makes sense to look to what Polansas has done to flesh that out further. Like the paper I think I referenced and I will not remember the exact uh, critiques that they set out, but the paper by Andreas Bella and Adam Morton, where they try and engage constructively with um, Simon Clark in particular from Open Marxism and say, this is all, solid and good but in order to operationalize this and talk about how you would actually start engaging the state form within a struggle to transform society you need to be able to grasp the concrete aspects of it and i think that that is where um plants us has something to offer and i mean maybe i'm just dim or missing something but i don't think there's any real reason that you can't make those concepts speak to each other usefully even if you can't perhaps marry them perfectly on theoretical terms that is where i land with it if you want to push me on any part of that please do go for it <laughs> Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Anna. Uh, yeah, I mean, no, no, I do believe that it is possible to have a dialogue. Uh, I, I do believe that in a certain way, Pulanzo's relation and conception offers the mediating steps in a more concrete way that enables a kind of a derivation. But it's also interesting. But there are also different strands within, let's say, open Marxism. Okay. 
if you took someone like Psychopedis, because Mark Psychopedis, this would lead more to a new Kantian solution <laughs> rather than you know a valid form of psych. Anyway, so who goes next? Peter or Francesca? Sure. Peter. Yeah, I can go. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. Yes, I mean I'm saying both that the the struggles from below have don't have the intensity that they may that they've had had in the past. That there's a weakness in you know in that if the the struggles were a kind of regulatory mechanism, the lopsidedness of, lopsidedness of the struggles today create a problem in terms of the possibility for relative autonomy and. Uh, the capacity for extended reproduction, uh, but also that the uh, 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 constraints, uh, 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 political constraints are such that the system becomes much more rigid. And in a sense, uh, um, it's not stronger. You know, capitalism or the capitalist class does not become stronger even given the, the weakness, let's say, of the struggle. It becomes much more vulnerable, and uh, 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 and the system inflexible. So a kind of radical break in some ways become uh, more possible, more thinkable. You know, even though of course the difficulty is how to do that, because you know in some ways I think the question of do you struggle inside or out, outside the state is a non-issue. You know, because again, in this, in this integral understanding of the state, the political struggles leave their impact, leave their residue, whether you like it or not. I mean, if the struggle is successful, it doesn't have to be focused on the state apparatus per se or through elections. If the, if the struggles are uh, 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 successful in any way, they will leave an impact on also the institutions, also the uh, uh, these kinds of things. So I think this is why I say we have to go in some ways beyond the old ideas and the old arguments, because we have reached a moment where some of the assumptions are no longer, no longer appear to hold, or at least they're in doubt in terms of how the struggles impact the institutions, the capacity of the system to regulate itself, to mediate uh, these conflicts. So it becomes much more, um, I think, an acute um, uh, 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 moment where it's all or nothing. Either you have, in a sense, revolution, or you have the you know the, the possibility of the system uh, 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 continuing as horrible as it is, with little hope for uh, uh, reforms for changes. Again, you know, I said like I said before, even to maintain some of the institutions of the old become a huge challenge. You know, let alone to expand. But I think for Francesca, I would like to uh, ask some questions because it seems like um, you want to get rid of not just the state, but politics, law, you know, everything, um, uh, which seems to give up too much to the liberal or the bourgeois understanding of all, of all these ideas as if there's no others, because certainly um, uh, uh, the 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 divide between civil society and political society, between public and private, let's say, is a liberal and bourgeois uh, creation. But there are legal traditions or understandings of politics uh, that don't do that, certainly are, are radically different. So I think, you know, the notion of politics in the classical sense that uh, we create ourselves, you know, that we create ourselves, you know, social uh, or social uh, selves. And we have to decide how to do it. I think is impossible to not accept the necessity of politics. You know that uh, politics is something that we have to uh, uh, decide. We're not. We're neither creations of a god nor of nature. We're self-created, and it's up to us to decide how how to create ourselves. So that classical notion that is in uh, uh, Aristotle, that is in Machiavelli. That is in Marx. You know, when Marx critiques the bourgeois no notion of, of of freedom and liberty in the Jewish question, in the divide of political of civil society uh, from political society, he's attacking exactly that loss and that reduction of a political agency and citizenship to this legal formality that you so correctly point to, uh, rather than making it concrete 
in something that it, that is real. Uh, so I don't I don't know why we have to abandon the idea of politics or the idea of law to liberate to, to achieve the kind of liberation that you are uh, pointing to. Francesca. Yeah, awesome questions. First, um, the question of, <clears throat> uh, you, you mentioned kind of Yotis, like this idea of a transition, uh, socialist legality. Did you mean during the transition, like that then withers away? Or did you mean like it lasts? Well, I... I mentioned it especially for the transition period, but I mean, uh, yeah. Okay, so um, that's cool. Thank you. Um, and you said, what about enhancing the rights of the subaltern, which I think is a good example of something that somebody might want to do in like a socialist transition. So, um, and I think that that bringing up the question of rights is a very, it's an easy way for me to make my point again. So like the idea of giving rights to a group of people because they need it. Like, so let's let's say something, let's be like, you have the right to not have your land taken away from you. Okay, so then if their land gets taken away from them, what do they have to do? They have to go somewhere and say, hello, my land has been taken from me. Like, can somebody please deal with this? So what are the problems that can arise during that process? Let me tell you, they are myriad. There are so many problems when you when a group that is supposedly oppressed supposedly is given a right, and then that thing that they're not supposed to have to deal with anymore happens again. That, and they have to go try to like make sure their right is enforced. I mean, you know, there's like no enforcement of most. I mean, that's why we have like the whole Black Lives Matter movement in uproar about you know black people getting killed for no reason by the police because they've been trying to stop it for two hundred years. And like, it won't stop. Doesn't matter what they do. They have, supposedly they have the right, but it, does, it literally doesn't matter. So I think that the in problem of enforcement of law, that's the, whole, that's the whole racialization piece, right? Law is always racialized. So you never have like the, like the, the what you call the subalterns, whatever, like you never have the people who are hierarchized on the bottom actually getting the rights that they are supposed to have. Like period, in my opinion, that is the nature of law because of how that system functions, of how you appeal things. Um, and in addition to that, the whole construction of giving a group of people rights means that they're not the ones controlling it in the first place, right? So like that, we, what we would want is a situation where they don't need to have a right. That thing is just not happening. And they are able to control the situation themselves, right? So how do we get to that? I'm saying, my argument is that the rights is not gonna get us there. Um, so in terms of uh, the, the not seeding the field of the political, well, like, okay, so thank you because you gave an example of what the political could mean. And you said it was um, to create ourselves. So to me, if you, create, if you say that there is this thing called the political, so there's spaces of the political, there's a field of the political, and what, it, what, what we do there is we create ourselves. That implies that there are non-political spaces, right? There's some times and places where we're not doing politics and other times where we are. Now those times and places where we aren't doing politics, who's the people that are more there? And who are the people that are more in the place where we're doing politics? There's always gonna be a divide and it's gonna cause problems. What if we thought of, let, so when I say like abolish the political, it's abolishing any separation between something that is political and something that is not political, right? So what if, what if there was no idea of the political and we're just doing it all the time, because <laughs> we are literally creating ourselves all the time. We don't need a platform to do that. We are doing it in every moment of every day. You don't think so? Um, and I also have questions for the others, but I think I need a moment to formulate them. Thanks a lot, Francesca. In the meantime, we do have some uh, questions and comments coming from the chat, the YouTube chat. One is a comment by Judith McVeigh, uh, and it says, we face contradictory states problem, which is practical today in climate movement, given state resistance to genuine action at uh, COP26. 
I suppose this, this could be turned into a, a question. Climate change is an interesting example of, of the, you know, limit, the limitations of current state action or, or, or the, the distance between rhetoric and action. Uh, you, can, uh, you, can, you can take this as a starting point if you wish. And there's also a, a more specific question by Ariana Introna who also presented at uh, this year conference, and it's really good, that even in, a, in an online conference, uh, so the presenters keep the HM spirit, which is you, you never just give your uh, panel and attend your presentation and only attend your panel, you attend the entire conference. So thanks, Ariana, for that. So uh, the question is, could you expand on which existing or not as yet existing social movements your different theoretical frameworks grasp as having most potential to again challenge, put pressure on the post-pandemic state? That's an interesting question. Which, which, which movements pose the greatest challenges today? Anyway, so uh, who wants to respond first? Francesca. You just add on my questions and then people can answer as they choose. Is that okay? Yeah, great, great, great. Okay. So, um, Anna, I wanted to ask, because you said this really briefly, like you kind of criticized this whiff of structuralism in uh, Puanza. And, um, and I'm just wanting to know, like, in your paradigm, what is so wrong with structuralism? And then for Peter, I wanted to ask you, um, I really was thinking a lot about taxes while you were talking. Um, and I was thinking about, I loved how you say relative autonomy of the state, like what is it relative autonomously, what is it relatively autonomous from? And you said kind of, I would like if you remind me what you said, I think you like the people um, and social movement, uh, whatever. So no, you remind me what you said, but I was thinking that it also is like relatively autonomous from any specific capitalist block that is funding it, right? Like when you have a state that we think is a little bit relatively autonomous, that means it's somehow able to get money and reproduce itself without being completely controlled by some specific capitalism. Um, and and, and how, one is the way we do that, taxes, and also you have like this MMT position of like central bank producing money. So like, how does the kind of like ability of the state to raise funds outside of capitalist whatever relate to your picture? Okay, we have a series of questions. Who wants to go first? Sure. Yeah, I'll go backwards maybe. Uh, on taxes, I think is a very good question. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, the, uh, again, the inability of the state to impose uh, certain uh, uh, taxes, let's say, right, to, to give these revenues is not a technical limitation. It's not a formal limitation. You know, when uh, uh, it's true, of course, today that through the increased uh, mobility of capital, uh, uh, capital can stash its, you know, hide in many places, you know, uh, it, it, not the coincidence that it's the same places the pirates used to hide their money, you know, Panama, uh, 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 the Canary Islands and, and, and Palmas and so forth. Uh, but the, it's not as if they, no one can find it. You know, after 9-11, uh, within two or three months, uh, they found every bank account that was associated with Al-Qaeda and, and, you know, and seized their, their, their money. So it's not, it's not a, a uh, the capital has outsmarted some notion of an autonomous state, is a, a lack of uh, uh, political uh, uh, capacity. Why? Because there is, there is not that relative autonomy from, or sufficient relative autonomy from the interests of the capitalist class, at least the, the narrow interests. So it, the state then can function on behalf of the class interest, let's say, of uh, the whole of, the, uh, of capitalism. Uh, so again, this is the kind of uh, problems um, that, I'm, that I'm pointing to, you know, that you have to have, and he also some ideas in leadership is not only the relative balance of forces, but some way to mobilize forces around a certain new uh, or more uh, uh, viable or reproducible uh, strategy of accumulation, of which there seems to be nothing. Uh, and I think here to, uh, to address some of the questions uh, 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 from uh, the chat, uh, 
Um, I think here the, the ecological movement is has the most potential as a, uh, a challenge uh, to what to what's happening because the ecological movement entails a, a radical rethinking of what the political community may be and how the connections between uh, 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 what what are the, the the substantive connections between people. So I think the ecological movement has the capacity to uh, uh, go beyond the limitations of uh, nationalized political communities, you know, to get back to, you know, I mentioned before um, the classical notion of, uh, of politics, you know, that we live together, you know, on one planet. I know now some of the billionaires have the fantasy to escape, of course, to go to the moon or Mars or who knows where, but, you know, we live together on one planet and it's up to us to decide how to live, let's say, in that sense of the community. So it is in many ways a challenge to the abstractness or the nationalized political community that presume, you know, that all these notions of formal equality and so forth uh, come from and, you know, to reimagine uh, some of these uh, connections. Thanks a lot. Anna? Uh, I'll build on your last point, Peter, and then turn to your question, um, Francisca. So uh, I would agree uh, in terms of the ecological movement, but insist on going back to what I was talking about earlier with the discussion of how that ecological movement is formed. Um, you know, like the the paper that I always refer people to for this is Matt Huber's Ecological Politics for the Working Class and specifically within that the discussion of green jobs as being jobs that are based on care and regeneration. So socio natures that are in and against capital, rebuilding people's capacity to further develop our forms of production in the future. So in New Zealand anyway, definitely the crisis of care that has emerged over the past decades in tandem with the ecological crisis has meant, you know, like there's, there are nurses striking, there are social workers and people who are involved in the social reproduction of their communities, you know, starting to build power and forge links with the ecological movement, with the labor movement more generally. And I think that's a persuasive case for something to be like the start of positive about maybe <laughs> to have like to use the whiff of expression again like to have a whiff of potential optimism about but who knows uh, and to return to the question of why I, why I dislike structuralism or brushed it off or what have you for me it was always like the magical moment of uh, economic determination in the last instance that made me not a fan at all of Althusserian structuralism, but um, yeah, it's it's an abstract formalism that I think Polanzas later work starts to get past and to really dig into how to engage with concrete struggles and determinations of power. So that's why I prefer his later work than his earlier work. Thanks a lot, Anna. Uh, Francesca? And before you speak, before, uh, uh, okay, uh, it's about one of our viewers, Judith McVeigh. Uh, unfortunately, the second part of the question that you, you mentioned in your in the chat never appeared. So if you can uh, uh, retype it, then we can relay it to our presenter. So, sorry. Francesca. Um, I was just gonna like pick up on the structuralism conversation because I feel like that is like weirdly central to a lot of these conversations about what is the state and what is the political and stuff because um, like stru structuralism in the sense of like rigorous logical connection of ideas, I think is like great, you know, like that all the ideas like are coherent with one another or they're striving to be as much as they can be. You know, it's like the string theory of social theory. Like we want all the ideas to work together, right? Um, and structuralism, like historically is, is uh, associated with, as you say, like an economic determinism. 
And I guess I'm just like interested in how like the sort of form theory or value form theory branch of Marxism can like approach the, can, can address the project of trying to make sure all, all of our ideas are like coherent with one another. We're not like having this idea and this idea and they're like kind of related, but like how do they really, you know, that's my thing with the state, like here's the state, here's capitalism and it kind of connected, but like how really are they connected? You know, so so I guess I'm just curious. So like, how, how are we talking about this now? 2021, you know, like most of those debates happened in like the 70s. Like, how are we now really thinking about like logical connectivity of the different ideas about capitalist mode of production? And then um, to Ariana's question, like. Uh, I just I guess I think all movements are important, I think that like things are only going to really change a if everybody's doing really different things all over the place i think that things become a problem when those movements want to institute their own law so they've decided that this is the way things have to be and they're gonna like push like when the revolution happens they're gonna push they're gonna be like oh we figured it out we know how things have to work and y'all need to like fall in line so it's more like what I don't think is good is like when movements go in that direction. Like I want to remain like, like completely curious about how we're going to deal with everything as we move forward. We just try, keep trying our best. Um, but I will also say that, um, what was I going to say? Uh, I lost it. Come back. Okay. So. We don't have any other question in the chat or any other comment at this uh, moment, but we have a few minutes, uh, I think. I'd like to say you know, one or two things yeah, about yeah. structuralism, this question about structuralism. Yes, please uh, Number one, I, do, I don't think there is really any, uh, there's nothing in Pulanzas' latter works that is not already there in some way or another in political power and social classes. And I don't think he became less structuralist per se. You know, the, the economic, the economy being turned in the last instance is, uh, 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 for me at least, simply Althusser, not one to be kicked out of the Communist Party. So he puts that in there, you know, so they cannot say, but you abandon, you know, one of the dogmas of the, of the party. He, the last instance, which never comes. So, is, there's nothing, uh, uh, just the opposite. The possibility of economic uh, determinism is possible only in a, uh, what people might call a diachronic or expressive totality, uh, where you have base superstructure, you know, these kinds of things. In a structural or a, syn a, a, a synchronic totality, there is no possible way to make that distinction because the relations are always Overdetermined in a sense, right? The whole determines the part. Um, so you, there can't be any simple determinism. You know, it is an, a, a, an eminently, it's out of necessity dialectical. Whereas if you have an expressive totality, if you have some of the older models, it can be very, uh, it can be deterministic or uh, undialectical, uh, depending on, you know, how it's being uh, wielded. So I think um, uh, is. It, it is a uh, uh, not uncommon, but I think it is a a a, a overly uh, 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 a formalistic attempt to kind of divide Bulanzas's works early and latter, uh, and also I think it it, it mis misrepresents what the structural totality is, because whether we're talking about linguistics, Saucer, if we're talking about Freud's interpretation of dreams, or we're talking about uh, Pulanzasian and Althusserian analysis of the state, the causal relations are uh, the same because the notion of the whole is the same. It's just different, you know, dreams, language, society, but, uh, you know, it's, I think, eminently uh, dialectical. Thanks a lot, Peter. Uh, as an Althusserian, I obviously uh, <laughs> agree that. Uh, Structures are relations, or to use the phrases, the phrasing of later on to say uh, encounters that manage to last. And in this sense, they are also open. They are open to change. I think this is this is the this is something that tends to be underestimated 
in regards to so-called structuralist approaches. And I think in a certain way, there is a continuum continuity there in Pulagius. I think that Pulagius from the beginning is rather relational in his thinking. And well, it, it would be good sometime to have a, a, a panel on, on, on early Pulagius, a reading of uh, uh, political power and social classes, I think is in the order of day. Anyway, now uh, we have the, the second part of, of Judith uh, McVeigh's uh, I think it's more a comment. We need state funds are in our contradiction. We need state funds for transition to renewables, yet the state hasn't opposed capitalist fossil fuels sufficiently. Today's more, more authoritarian state must be focused on struggles. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is more of a comment. Rather. I think that uh, uh, most, I think all, all three presenters in one way or the other, I mean, uh, this is a point they made that, even if there were, you know, different not approaches, different, uh, you know, e emphasis given, they all accepted the need for struggles. I think this is something that we can all agree on that uh, whatever, you know, approach we take towards the state, struggles are the starting, uh, the starting point. I mean, you cannot, I mean, this is in a certain way why we're still Marxists and not, you know, Hegelians, they don't go for, thinking of an improved state, we're still thinking on the priority class struggle. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on this comment, but we're still, we're, we're almost running out of time. That's why I'm saying it. So uh, any other further comments? One minute suggestion, phrase? Um, well, one, I wish we had more time to talk about the encounter, but we'll leave that for another time. But uh, I, I remember the thing I was going to say about Ariana's uh, question, which kind of feeds into this thing that Judith brought up, which is the military. Um, like, uh, military is not the most important thing, but like, we don't talk about the, mil you know, military is like backing everything up, like the intense money put into the mil US military. So like the military people have got to like be in the struggle at some point, because if they're not, we're screwed. So like I'm I'm kind of interested in thinking about like where are there people in the military that are succeeding in like doing like socialist communist stuff, um, and uh, that also relates to the to the um, climate change stuff. Like like how much is like brute force preventing these things from happening? But maybe you guys can say another. Thing. We have a last minute question for for Peter. Uh... To, uh, which is from uh, anyway, JP, SP Jose. Anyway, great question. I was wondering how your end of relative autonomy differs about from the old argument about state capture by capital. Is this a new phase or always true? This is the question. Peter, you have like one minute to answer. Uh, and First of all, it's a question mark. So I don't say there is the end of real autonomy, but there are signs with the pandemic, especially that maybe things move uh, in that direction. But the difference is in terms of uh, uh, why, because the state capture argument uh, largely had to do with the personnel who run the state. You know, the capitalists have taken over the state. And my argument has is not to do with that. It has to do with... Uh, how uh, the role of the state as a mediator of struggles and as something, you know, as something that uh, 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 works towards the extended reproduction of capitalist relations, how those mechanisms have uh, become uh, uh, much more calcified, much more inflexible. You know, the processes through which the state achieved those things seem to be breaking down. So it's a, the, the why is very different, even though if maybe the, if the, consequences might be similar, uh, the how it works is very different. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, I think that uh, if there isn't any other, uh, com uh, any other uh, comment to be made by the presenters, Anna, anything? Oh, okay, good. I think it was a really good panel. Uh, I mean, these are open questions, but at least I mean, it helped us all to rethink while engaging in struggles, also to think in a more theoretical and more strategic way. 
And uh, I would like just to remind our presenter, our first of all, to thank our uh, presenters for the really uh, thought-provoking presentations. This would normally uh, be, uh, you know, a hand clapping moment, but unfortunately, it's not so uh, it's not possible in a Zoom meeting. And also thank our viewers and for, for watching and uh, and commenting and asking questions and Hay Market for support. And uh, just to remind, there's another full day of the conference tomorrow. It's a Sunday, so you don't work. So what? How better to spend a Sunday than watching? for really interesting panels of good Marxist theory. Uh, again, please support the HM project, the historical material project in any possible means and keep the struggle going on. Good afternoon, evening or good night, depending on the time zone. See you at our next panels. So bye bye.